Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome back to our 16th Annual TELUS Health Conference, presented virtually again this year. Uh, on behalf of TELUS Health, I would like to thank you for joining us for our fourth webinar in our series. If you've been following along, our first presentation was on data and trends. The second one was one that I shared regarding a case study on diabetes. And last week's was a panel discussion on virtual care. I'm particularly excited for today's presentation as I think you'll see it's a good extension and continuation of where I left with my presentation on diabetes. And for those of you who have been following the webinar series, it's me again, Jason, your MC for the, se for the series. And when I'm not emceeing presentations, I like to spend my time refereeing fights between my five-year-old daughter and my mother-in-law, who after three, three months of this have somehow turned into an old married couple. I also happen to be the Director of Health Benefits Consulting here at TELUS Health. In terms of uh, making this conference possible, we'd like to say thank you to our Insurer Steering Committee, as well as to our sponsors. And before we begin, I'd like to share some important tips on ways to optimize your webinar experience. Uh, as you may have noticed in the previous seminars, uh, we've had a growing audience. Today we have 805 participants for uh, today's webinar, really excited about that. But we recommend that you use your phone to listen to the presentation versus the WebEx audio and turn off your volume uh, on your computer for better sound quality. Your audio on your phone should be muted by default as well. And we have a chat functionality in WebEx here, so uh, please feel free to network with other participants and use the chat function to interact with the, the panelists here. Um, speaking of that, there are two ways to ask questions to the presenter. One is into the chat at any point during the presentation, and we'll queue those up for the end. And the second is by request during the Q&A. Uh, we'll go through the instructions on that later on in the presentation. Um, if you do happen to experience any technical difficulties on WebEx, please email us at teleshealth at telus.com or send a message through the chat function uh, to Susie Kim, my colleague, and we'll do our best to address these questions. Um, as with past webinars, this will be made available on the TELUS Health Benefits Hub in about a week's time. Uh, to be notified, simply subscribe to the mailing list if you aren't already a subscriber. Uh, you, you should note that past webinars are being hosted there, so be sure to check those out if you have miss, missed them. Uh, there's been lots of great content. And of course, uh, as we mentioned previously, we're eager to improve, trying to get better at this, so please help us out. Uh, there's a three-minute survey at the end of this uh, uh, webinar, and you'll receive an email again tomorrow. We ask that you please participate. Tell us what we did well, what could be improved, other topics you'd like to hear about. Uh, as far as CE credits, they do function a little differently this year, given the change of format. Uh, the participant list from this webinar will be submitted along with the material for CE credits. Uh, do be patient with us. Give us a few weeks, and we will get back to you on that. And now, without further ado, the person you came to see here today, I'd like to introduce you to today's speaker, Dr. Brendan Byrne. Dr. Byrne has been a physician and digital pioneer for the past 25 years. Trained at Yale and McGill, he has had a parallel career as an entrepreneur. From, her, from his original practice in New Westminster, BC, Brendan created an electronic medical record software called Wolf, which is widely used by physicians across the country. He previously served as Chief Innovation Officer for TELUS Health, and we're honored to have him here with us today. Dr. Byrne, over to you. Hi, um, super excited to be able to uh, participate with everyone today. And uh, my hope is actually to get some dialogue going. Uh, this is a topic that's near and dear to me um, in my practice and something I've become very passionate about. Um, as we get started, there may be a little bit of technical difficulties on the formatting here, so we're going to be in for a bit of an adventure. So what I wanted to talk to everybody about was the promise and potential of diabetes reversal. Always best to actually start with a story, and this one does start with a story, uh, and this is Don's story. Um, so Don was a 57-year-old uh, fellow that came and saw me a couple of years ago, and I just, it's just started a new lifestyle medicine practice and was looking to try to help people prevent and reverse uh, disease. But Don came in with a very unique story. So he's type 2 diabetic, and he's interested 
in using ketogenic diet to reverse his diabetes because he'd heard a lot about this on the internet. Um, next slide. So he had a 25-year history of uh, type 2 diabetes. He'd been on insulin for 20 years, on an, been on an insulin pump for nine years, and he was taking more than 200 units of insulin per day, but still not controlling his blood sugars. They're greater than 15 millimoles per liter, so three times the normal uh, level. Uh, his hemoglobin A1C was wildly out of control. Um, and just to, for, for those of you that are technical, we ordered C peptide to see if his pancreas was actually producing its own insulin, and it was very, very low. So with Don, I didn't really know what to tell him in terms of his potential for reversing diabetes. So conventional wisdom holds that, uh, you know, diabetes is something that is going up in prevalence. Uh, so we, we've all seen these statistics, um, you know, the, the prevalence of diabetes has raised, uh, you know, from 3% in 1998 to 29% of people now having, you know, diabetes or prediabetes, almost 10% with the diagnosis. Um, so we see kind of this, this, this epidemic of diabetes. Um, all right, next slide. And conventional wisdom would, would tell us that uh, diabetes is a chronic progressive disease. It's something that can be slowed by vigorous use of lifestyle changes and medications, but it eventually involves vascular damage and, and organ failure. Next slide. And medical treatment, it, you know, really doesn't lead to any remission. And in fact, the big study in Kaiser, over 75,000 people, the spontaneous remission rate was less than 1%. So this didn't look very promising for Don. You know, when you look at it further, you know, time, uh, basically, you know, when somebody is diagnosed with diabetes, by nine years, less than 25% of people can be controlled on one medication. And after 10 to 12 years, 50% of people require insulin. Um, and so this, this was really kind of what I was armed with when I saw Don. Uh, so he wanted to take control of his health, but you know, really the, the facts seem to be against him. So I started to look at this question, you know, can diabetes be reversed? And the first place to go is actually back to bariatric surgery. Um, and this, this is the, really the first hint that something may be going on here that is reversible. So 1992, the first study came out uh, showing 10-year uh, remission rates of 90% uh, in bariatric surgery. So basically when, when you do surgery on the stomach to bypass the stomach um, and you get weight loss from that, um, there's diabetes remission. So that was interesting. Further studies over time, depending on the procedure and the type of uh, you know, trial they ran, would show remission ranges of 30 to 70%. And what was fascinating when you looked at this and you, you started to understand it was the long-term remission uh, correlates with weight loss. Um, so that's been something that we've, we've said for a long time. If you can lose some weight, you have a chance of controlling your diabetes better, uh, perhaps reversing it. Um, but the reversal came within the first few weeks. Uh, so almost immediately, you would start to see control of, uh, of glucose uh, and, uh, and, and reduction of medications for these patients. So the, you know, going down this path, I found uh, a fellow in the, in the UK, Dr. Roy Taylor, Newcastle, um, who really went at this quite systematically over a period of about 10 to 15 years. Um, and so he, he essentially had come up with this, uh, what he called the twin cycle theory. Uh, and the twin cycle theory he calls a metabolic vicious cycle, and it really revolves around this notion of liver fat uh, and pancreas fat uh, causing the, the root, you know, being behind the root cause of type 2 diabetes. And we'll get into this model in a little bit more detail. Um, so he went through, and through a series of studies, the counterpoint study, the counterbalance study, and finally the direct study, uh, developed systematic proof. And, you know, from all the way from cell studies right into primary care that this could be reversed. Uh, and then to complete the circle, he went back to bariatric surgery and showed that the changes that he had discovered really were uh, the same thing that was causing the remission in bariatric surgery. So this was interesting. This started to suggest to me that we could do better. Um, so the direct study was the primary care study, and you know, their conclusion was the type 2 diabetes is really a complication of weight gain and excess body fat uh, that's not necessarily permanent. 
Uh, and what they showed in this study was, uh, and they took early type 2 diabetes, so people four years diagnosis or less, nobody on insulin, so it's still not quite good enough for Dawn, uh, but 73% were able to achieve remission if they could lose 10 kilograms, and 86% could achieve remission if they could lose 15 kilograms. Digging a little bit deeper um, and, and looking at kind of what probably triggered Don's kind of entry to my clinic was uh, something emerging from Berta Health. So this is actually a company in the United States that's doing a trial. They're now in their second year. This is their first year result. Ketogenic diet, so very low carbohydrate. This is non-randomized, but it did include people uh, with long-standing diabetic diabetes and those on insulin. And what they showed was 94% decreased or eliminated uh, insulin dosage, 12% uh, weight loss, 60% showed hemoglobin below the diabetes threshold. Um, so they would say about a 60% remission rate uh, at one year in this study. So there's, there's definitely some interesting evidence that says, can, you know, can type 2 diabetes really be reversed? Yes. Um, what's Fascinating between all three lines of evidence is that the changes in blood sugar come before the weight loss. Uh, and in Roy Taylor's work, he showed that it directly relates to the changes in liver and pancreas function. And that long-term remission depends on weight loss and the maintenance of that weight loss. So starting to feel a little bit better about what we could do for Dawn. Um, and so that led me to kind of start to put, put this together in a way that I could explain to people and in a way that would be actionable. So when you think about di type 2 diabetes, uh, we can come up with some definitions. So technical definition is that diabetes is a disorder that disrupts the way our body uses uh, sugar or glucose. Um, that's okay, but it doesn't really distinguish between type 1 and type 2 diabetes. Um, we could say type 2 diabetes more specifically is a disease of insulin resistance eventually leading to decreased insulin secretion. Uh, and that's kind of technical, and you know we, we will explain that today, but really the definition I landed on, and I think the definition that makes the most sense, is diabetes is this disorder of energy overload. Now, energy overload for us is manifested as fat. That's how we store energy. Um, and so it's a it, disorder of energy overload. Our body tries, but ultimately fails to accommodate. Uh, and each person's threshold for this is different. Uh, this made sense to me because I see diabetics in all shapes and sizes. Um, with very many different histories. So there definitely was this difference between people on that. So if you really want to understand diabetes, you have to step back and look at what happens when we eat. And so when we eat food, we're getting energy from food. And food, uh, major components or macronutrients of food are fat, protein, and carbohydrates. And so if we start to go through this, um, the, the, these macronutrients are broken down through a process called digestion. Fats get broken down as fatty acids, proteins to amino acids, and carbohydrates to glucose. So these are the building blocks uh, for, for metabolism. So we break down the food. Uh, and in the case of fat, it gets absorbed. Uh, and the only thing, I won't go through the detail of this, a little bit complicated, um, but the thing that's interesting here is re just really the fat gets absorbed into the systemic circulation rather than, uh, so it gets distributed throughout the body uh, before it comes back to the liver, um, where the others are different. Um, protein, essentially, you know, uh, there are nine essential amino acids that we need to eat. The rest we can make from those nine essential amino acids. Um, and protein is just built of amino acids. So, um, but really from an energy standpoint, protein doesn't play a big role. We don't really use protein for energy. We use fat and we use carbohydrate or glucose. Um, and so then the carbohydrates. So carbohydrates, there's three types. There's sugars, there's starches, and there's fibers. Um, but probably the best way to think about this is in terms of simple or complex. Uh, and the simple are the carbohydrates that generate an insulin response. They basically get broken down into glucose. Uh, the complex uh, either don't get absorbed like fiber or the complex starch should get absorbed so slowly that they don't generate much of an insulin response. Um, and insulin, just to remind everybody, is the hormone that will control our blood sugars. So triggered by when we eat a carbohydrate, it gets broken down into glucose. Glucose enters uh, the bloodstream from the small intestine. Uh, that minute change in blood glucose will result in the release of insulin from the pancreas. Um, but the key thing to remember here, especially as we tell the story, is that insulin is a storage hormone. Insulin wants to store everything. 
uh, and not just carbohydrates. So it wants to uh, absorb kind of the, the glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids, so the building blocks from our food. Uh, and it wants to store the glucose as glycogen, the fatty acids as fat, and the amino acids as protein. It's also going to stop you from breaking down any of these stored forms of energy. So insulin is the storage hormone. This, you're asking, why, what is this? It's a teaspoon of sugar. This is how much glucose is in your body at one time. And so you start to realize, hmm, if we eat some carbohydrate uh, that gets absorbed fairly quickly, um, it's going to generate insulin because our body only has a single teaspoon of glucose circulating in our, in our blood at any one time. And when you look at some of the common, uh, so if you, if you look at it from this perspective, you know, let's take a, a glass of orange juice. The glass of orange juice is the equivalent of six of these teaspoons. Uh, and let's be, let's be fair, um, the sugar in it is actually sucrose, and it's a mixture of glucose and fructose. Um, so it's three times the amount of glucose that's circulating in our body. But we just drank one glass of orange juice, and now we've got three times the amount of glucose uh, being absorbed very rapidly into our bloodstream. So what's going to happen? The beta cells in our pancreas are going to release uh, insulin to maintain normal glucose levels. Uh, and essentially, most of that sugar is going to end up in our muscles, so 80 to 90 percent of it in our uh, muscles, which is, I like to call it our glucose sink. The, glu the liver also stores glycogen, as we'll see, um, so some of it will get stored here. Uh, and any remaining uh, glucose will get turned into fat. So that's what happens when we eat. You know, it, it basically, we, we, we store the fat. It gets distributed around the body. Uh, some of the cells will use it. Some of it will get stored directly. Uh, proteins get used for protein turnover. Uh, any extra protein will get turned into, uh, essentially get turned into fat. And the, the carbohydrate gets absorbed uh, and, you know, tops up our levels of glycogen in the muscle, tops up our levels of glycogen in the liver, and stores anything extra as fat. So what happens when we're not eating? So when we're not eating, essentially, we want to maintain our blood sugar at 5.5 millimoles per liter or less. Um, roughly speaking, that's two teaspoons of sugar that needs to be generated per hour. So there's always one teaspoon circulating. So basically, the, the blood sugar turns over about twice per hour, uh, and our brain uses one teaspoon per hour. So our brain's using that. Uh, and the liver gets controlled by the pancreas through the release of two hormones, insulin, our storage hormone, which stops the breakdown. Uh, it stops the, uh, basically results in the storage of glucose. And glucagon, which results in the breakdown of stored glucose from glycogen or from other sources through something called gluconeogenesis. So we get, have this nice little balance that stays in place when we're, when we're not eating. And that's the liver's job. That's the primary job of the liver is to maintain blood sugar. So two teaspoons per hour ticking away under the control of the pancreas. So everything's good. So let's look at this now that we kind of understand it. What happens in diabetes? So first of all, in type 2 diabetes, the process is insulin resistance. So what's going on is essentially uh, insulin's not working as well. And so it takes more and more insulin to release the same amount of glucose, to store the same amount of glucose. Uh, and insulin resistance can happen for a variety of reasons. We know it happens with age. Uh, we're not as insulin sensitive when we're uh, 50 as we were when we were 20. Genetics, we see this run in families, and we see uh, uh, you know, certain uh, groups of people have high, very high rates of diabetes. But also we see it with the weight gain. Uh, we see it with sedentary behavior. We see it with stress. We see it with poor sleep. We see it with nutrition. And for most people, it's a combination of all of the above. So let's go back to our glass of orange juice. It's still worth six teaspoons of sugar, which represents three times the amount of glucose uh, entering the body. And the pancreas is still going to release insulin. In fact, in this case, it's going to have to release more insulin because uh, insulin is not working as well. Um, so it's going to go to the muscle, but the muscle is not going to absorb it. Um, so as the muscle becomes insulin resistant, it does not absorb uh, as much uh, of this glucose. And then the, the liver can store some of the, the glucose as glycogen, but the capacity is limited. The liver, in fact, can only store 30 teaspoons of, of glucose, just to keep using the teaspoon analogy. Um, and so more and more of that glucose is turned into fat. And the trouble is, remember, insulin is a storage hormone. So with rising insulin levels, 
we lose our ability to burn fat. So you've got this one-way storage phenomena, which leads to weight gain. But remember, didn't I say that weight gain also leads to insulin resistance? And this is where Roy Taylor's metabolic vicious cycle begins. So you start to get these weight gains. So, you know, a moment on the lips, forever on the hips, that is insulin resistance. It's this one-way storage that has you gain weight. Now, gaining weight uh, isn't necessarily a problem, but over time, your fat cells actually become full, and the fat spills over, uh, which leads to fat in the wrong places. Um, and fat in the wrong places really is the belly fat and the fat that's going to end up in the liver and pancreas if we jump ahead a little bit. And so you start to see this energy overload. So the energy from the food is getting stored as fat, but eventually we, we overload the system. And it's really important to kind of stop back and recognize, like, there's two ways that we store fat. We either increase the number of fat cells or we increase the size of fat cells. So pretty basic. Our challenge for, on an individual level is that we, the number of our fat cells, our healthy subcutaneous fat cells, is set by the age of two. Right? So we have all the fat cells we're going to get by age two. Um, so some people get a lot of fat cells and can store a lot of fat without getting uh, diabetes. Uh, and some people can't. And their fat cells only can get bigger and bigger and they start to leak out earlier. Um, and so you start to see this notion of a difference between being overweight and being sick. Um, so being overweight is you're just storing the energy safely. Uh, being sick is when you're starting to accumulate weight in places that it shouldn't be, the abdominal area specifically. So back to our liver, this unabsorbed glucose uh, and fat, so we're getting the glucose from the muscle and the fat uh, from the fat cells, uh, has to be dealt with by the liver. The liver's got to do everything here. And so what we see is the liver can export the fat, uh, but this just increases visceral fat. So you see this on your cholesterol panel, by the way, if you look at your triglycerides. So you know, doctors always talk about good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, but tucked into that profile is something called triglycerides, which is liver, it's the fat that your liver is exporting. So if your liver fat triglycerides are over two, uh, you've likely got insulin resistance. Um, anything over one is probably not optimal. So uh, go check your liver results, your, your lipid results. Um, so we export in, yeah, increasing visceral fat or we store the fat in the liver, resulting in fatty liver. And, and or we do both, right? And, and most people are probably doing both. Oh, and don't forget our friend uh, fructose here. So, you know, we said that the sugar was a combination of glucose and fructose. The glucose, we've talked about the pathway there, uh, but the fructose goes straight to the liver uh, and it actually gets turned into triglycerides and fat as well, just to make things worse. Um, same story, unfortunately, with alcohol. Uh, and so now we're at our fourth player here. So we've gone through, we've looked at what happens to muscle, we looked at what happens to fat, and what happens to liver. Um, and our fourth player in this is the pancreas. Um, so normally these pancreatic beta cells release insulin in response to glucose levels. Um, but this insulin resistance process, the pancreas absorbs some of this fat um, and it becomes dysfunctional. And the beta cells in the pancreas release less insulin. And this is where we start to see diabetes. Um, so over time, fewer, uh, fewer uh, pancreatic beta cells can produce insulin, and uh, they're pumping out more and more insulin, uh, trying to maintain the blood sugar, and eventually they fail. So these are the four blows that I've talked about. Um, I do need to say, because this is in our definition, this always comes in the place of energy overload. And so if we look at this kind of from, you know, more diagrammatically, we have this energy overload or too many calories, um, we have the decreased muscle glucose uptake, and we've got this fat spillover. And all of these things are leading to increased liver fat. The increased liver fat results in the liver not responding properly to insulin. Ah, insulin resistance. So that's what's happening. The liver fat is causing insulin not to uh, work as well in the liver. And what this does is it increases blood glucose which results in the pancreas, in turn, increasing the basal amount of insulin. So we start to see the insulin levels climb up. And remember, insulin is the storage hormone, so we start to gain weight, which just only makes the matters worse. 
Um, the liver also exports some of this fat as triglycerides that we talked about, and that ends up in the pancreas. And when it ends up in the pancreas, it decreases the pancreas's ability to uh, secrete uh, insulin. And this cycle goes around. And this is Roy Taylor's twin cycle theory. So how do we stop this cycle? We get rid of the liver fat. And if we do that, we'll decrease the, the, the basal requirements um, and we'll normalize our blood sugars. Um, and we get rid of the pancreas fat and we'll improve our insulin response to meals. So this sounds pretty easy. And when you look at it and you do the MRI studies like Taylor did, there's only about 400 grams of fat in the liver to lose. There's, and there's, there's just a few grams of fat in the pancreas. So if we had a magic wand and we could touch diabetics on the liver or pancreas uh, and remove that fat instantly, um, we could probably just reverse diabetes like that. Alas, we don't have a magic wand. Um, so we have to do things differently. Let's, let's look at this a little bit differently. And so here what I want to do is I want to essentially look at glucose versus insulin over time. And so this is our, our, our uh, fasting glucose level, 5.5 millimoles per liter. Remember, that's our teaspoon of glucose. Um, and in insulin resistance, what's happening is we're getting this phenomena where insulin levels are rising, 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 and then they start to plateau. Our pancreas simply cannot produce any more insulin. And in fact, our pancreas is being affected by the same process, so it's, some of the cells are just not producing. And this process here, once, the, once, the, it, once you have the plateau and you start to see the glucose go up, we call this prediabetes. And this is 10 to 15 years in. So you realize by the time we call something pre-diabetes, which sounds like it's before the main event, the main event's been going on for 15 years. The other thing that we need to know is that by the time you get to pre-diabetes, 50% of the pancreatic beta cells are not working properly, and the insulin levels are two to three times normal. If we carry this a little bit further and we get to full-blown diabetes, what we see here is that you've got an 80% in pancreatic beta cells by this time. So really, I think about this in terms of two phases. There's this first phase of insulin resistance, which is predominantly marked by weight gain and the beginning of abdominal fat, uh, and the second phase called dec of decreased insulin secretion. And we don't see abnormal blood sugars till the second phase. And when we think about insulin resistance, it's really too much insulin, right? So the, the paradigm in diabetes has always been about too much glucose, which does happen at the end. But on the way, it's about too much insulin. And insulin on its own is a problem. So if you look at metabolic syndrome, uh, three out of five of these criteria are required for diagnosis. Um, but only one of them is abnormal blood sugars. So there are people that get uh, multiple effects of metabolic syndrome without necessarily having diabetes or abnormal blood sugars. And I won't go into all of these things, but, but a lot of the pathology associated with diabetes actually comes from this high level of insulin. Uh, and many people may not ever manifest that high blood sugar. So we have our four blows. There is this fellow as well, and this is cortisol, our stress hormone. And that's probably doing a disservice to cortisol, so maybe we should call it our get-up-and-go hormone. Um, but cortisol counteracts insulin. It basically works against insulin. So anything that chronically raises cortisol will worsen insulin resistance, so it'll make this picture worse. Uh, so increased stress will drive cortisol, also will drive appetite, which doesn't help. And lack of sleep does the same thing. So these are blows five and six. And so the type 2 diabetes reversal strategy, the 4 plus 2, has to take this into account. And so we need to actually work our way backwards through this and say, well, what would we do to change the course of this disease? And so the first thing is actually if we can go with whole foods, low carbohydrates, or as I like to sometimes say, slow carbohydrates, so carbohydrates that don't generate that insulin response, um, then what we're going to find is that we're going to decrease the amount of insulin that the, that the uh, pancreas has to produce, which is going to help right away. And remember, we only have that single teaspoon of glucose circulating, 
Uh, and if you start to look at food, uh, and remember insulin is, you know, that's going to generate this insulin response and the whole insulin as a storage hormone. Um, and when you start to look at food, you start to realize that there are foods that generate massive uh, insulin responses. Um, so, you know, you, you could look at our, our orange juice, which we use the example for, but, you know, a bowl of basmati rice is the equivalent of 10 teaspoons of glucose. It's the equivalent of 10 times the amount of sugar that's in your body right now. Or my favorite, the pancake, 14 uh, teaspoons. That's not including the maple syrup. And that's only one pancake. And I don't know too many of us that only eat one pancake. Um, so you have to watch these things because they, uh, they, they just turn up your requirement for insulin. So, so you know, whole foods, slow carbohydrate would be step one. Step two, we have to increase activity. Uh, and so this really comes back to, you know, the 150 minutes a week of exercise that is recommended for everyone. Um, and this is all about making the muscles at work do their job as the glucose sink. Um, and remember, when we looked at this from a liver fat perspective, uh, we had too many calories, fat spillover. But there you have the, you know, the decreased muscle glucose intake resulting in liver fat. Um, and so we, we need to, to get the muscles playing their role. The third thing is we have to be kind to our liver because uh, the problem is that liver fat developing, which decreases our ability to respond to our own insulin. Um, and really kind of the, the analogy here, don't throw fuel on the fire. So you already have the fire going because you have um, you know, fat spill from the fat cells that are full, uh, glucose spillover from the muscle if the muscles aren't taking up the, the, the glucose. Um, but alcohol and fructose are just gonna lead to more liver fat. Um, so if we stop doing that, it's going to help. And our friend fructose, we can't forget. So we, we want to stop the alcohol and fructose. Step four, we need to restore fat burning. And so um, the, the combination of reducing the insulin levels, kind of step one, uh, the increased activity, step two, and less alcohol and fructose, step three, they all contribute to our ability to start to burn fat. Um, but we have to reduce the intake, right? We, so we have to either have a reduced intake. Uh, Time-restricted eating, intermittent fasting are, are two, two methods that we use a lot uh, that work very, very well and, and help to start to make people more metabolically flexible. And in fact, if you do the first three things, what people will find is that they, they start to be able to go 12, 14, 16 hours without eating because they restore their metabolic flexibility and they're able to burn fat again. Um, so rather than just kind of, you know, stopping, you know, not making the dietary changes, not making the exercise changes, um, doing those things first and then starting this really is, is the potent combination. Um, and remember we said stop the cycle, we've got to get rid of the liver fat and we want to get rid of the pancreas fat. Um, and this was kind of our pound of butter, so our 400 grams that we wish we had the magic wand for. Um, but what we know from the direct study is if we can uh, get 73%, you know, 73% in that population, 10 kilos, they, they had remission, 86% uh, with 15 kilos. So we, we need to lose a significant amount of weight. Now, of course, if you follow the, what I'm talking about, this will have variation. So you'll have some people that need to lose more, some people that need to lose less, depending on what their peripheral fat threshold was. So, so that's the four in our, in our four plus two, um, nothing very complicated there. Uh, and then the plus two really deals with our friend, the uh, cortisol, our stress hormone. Uh, and this one is really learning to de-stress, so taking some measures to, to you know, pull down the stress level, keep the cortisol down. So either avoiding stress or changing our perception of stress or improving our ability to recover. Uh, so some focus there, uh, as well as uh, the, the, uh, the, the sixth one, which is improving our sleep. And so sleep has that effect as well. And if we actually get the right amount of sleep, uh, we can actually see our cortisol levels go down, which will help with this process. And there's our plus two. So we've, we, we've now kind of lined up a lifestyle medicine way to, to approach this. And put together, we call it the four plus two strategy. And what's interesting when you look at this is, is well, what would the return on investment be for the strategy if it works? And so when we look here and we realize that the average age of diabetes is 45, uh, and usually the initial medication is metformin. So this is actually 
pretty minimal cost. So uh, kind of early diabetics are pretty cheap to, to, to manage. Um, I just need control again of the slides. Sorry. There we go, thanks. Um, but by nine years, 75% of people will, will need another medication. Um, so if year three, that somebody started on a, a GLP-1 agonist, the annual cost for that's about $1,800. Uh, by 10 to 12 years, 50% will uh, chance that this, this person will need insulin. Um, so if at year 10 uh, she was started on insulin, um, you start to see this, this average person kind of, you know, generating over $50,000 of medication costs uh, to, to age 65. If we factor in kind of other things that um, related to diabetes in terms of productivity and, and missed work, you know, estimated about $1,500 per year, you start to get close to 80K. Um, and we haven't factored in short and long-term disability, and we haven't looked at other diagnoses that go along with diabetes. Um, and so really what you, what you see here is, is, you know, an overwhelming case that this costs a lot of money for employers and, and, uh, uh, and, and, and people uh, as they go through this. So what would it cost to, to essentially do a 4 plus 2 program, uh, you know, over the course of a year? Uh, and this would vary depending on exactly kind of the intensity level uh, and depending kind of where somebody is. But the costs here are about $2,000 to $4,000 in that first year you know, with the maintenance costs thereafter. So you start to see that there is going to be uh, a significant return on investment, you know, somewhere around, you know, a, a 25 uh, times return on investment. So what would it take, you know, what would the trigger be for this? Would it be, you know, the diagnosis? Would we Would we do it at diabetes. Um, not sure that makes sense, but it, you know, it certainly when the costs start to accumulate. Um, would we do it with the first expensive medication? Uh, so somewhere in that first nine years. Um, what about pre-diabetes? Because this process is 10 to 15 years in by then. Uh, and generally speaking, the earlier you start with it, the, the more likely it is to reverse, and, and maybe the intensity can be less. So, I've gone all the way through kind of this explanation and this, this intellectual journey uh, that I've went through, but let's go back to Don. So Don was started on the 4 plus 2 strategy. So he, remember, he came in, he wanted to do ketosis and ketogenic uh, uh, diet. Um, but we just stepped back and said, well, Don, let's, let's actually go a little bit slower and a little bit more simply. Um, let's, you know, start getting you eating whole foods because that was an issue for Don. Um, let's make sure that the, the, the carbohydrates within those foods are such that they don't generate a massive insulin response. Uh, let's make sure that you've got healthy fats. Let's make sure that you're getting enough protein. So really some pretty basic uh, blocking and tackling by our dietitian. Um, and with this, Don had an immediate reduction of his insulin by 40%, uh, with his blood sugars actually coming into control. So remember, they were completely wildly out of control. Um, so, so, so far, so good. Um, this was fascinating. Don's major symptom was chronic pain. Uh, in fact, he wasn't working because of chronic pain. Um, and so he, he said he, he couldn't do any activity or uh, exercise. Within three weeks, within three weeks, this was gone. So uh, the inflammatory response of what he was doing uh, basically went away and his pain went away. By four months, Don's hemoglobin A1C had decreased from 11.9% to 6.5%. Um, so he's coming now down to kind of more like pre-diabetes levels of, of hemoglobin A1C, but he was still on insulin, right? He's on 60 units of insulin today, uh, per day. The C-peptides, remember that was the kind of, you know, the, the, the marker of how much his pancreas is producing, right? And so by the time you see somebody like Don, you, you think that the pancreas no longer makes insulin, and that's why he needs to be on so much insulin his C-peptide was now normal. So he had gone from being very, very low to normal, meaning that his pancreas was starting to make uh, a normal amount of insulin. Now, he was still taking extra insulin because he still had insulin resistance. Um, by this point, he lost 25 pounds, and his pants were three pant sizes smaller. By eight months, Don was off insulin. His hemoglobin A1C is stable. He, he was still on other medications, so he's, he's not, he's not you know, completely reversed at this point. Um, 
but his T-peptide levels are now high, which is kind of interesting, right? So he's now making all the insulin he needs. He's still insulin resistant, so he still needs more insulin than the average person, um, but he's restored his pancreatic function to the place that his pancreas is now able to make more insulin. Um, and Don's lost 70 pounds, and he's, uh, you know, he's still improving. Um, but probably most significantly, his life's changed. He's a completely different person. And so my challenge for you, uh, and my challenge actually for, for all of us really here, is I think we need to look at this and think different, right? I think we've got to go away from the dominant paradigm in diabetes, which is glycemic control, and, and look at this uh, from this from this notion of what's happening with insulin. Uh, I think we need to think prevention. The earlier we start, the better. Um, and so at the very beginning, we talked about kind of the rates of diabetes and the fact that kind of a third of Canadians are uh, diabetic or pre-diabetic. Um, that's one in three. You know, and so this is affecting everybody. Um, but we also need to think reversal. Just because there's a diagnosis does not mean that it cannot be reversed. And so we need to start doing this. Um, and we, I think we need to start this now. I, I think that it's something that people need to be aware of, and it's something that they need to, we need to work at systematically. Um, and my challenge for, for, for all of you that are in positions to potentially look at this as part of benefits is to say, you know, what are you doing from a proof of concept point? Can you prove the ROI? You know, where's the best point to start this? Um, but don't wait because this is, this, is, this is happening. And, you know, the key thing, the thing that drives my passion is, you know, seeing somebody like Don go from the person who walked into my clinic to the person that, you know, after eight months is off of insulin. Um, it's, a completely, it's a complete transformation. And so we need to start to work at this. And, and I think we have to prove the ROI, right? And, and, and what's challenging with this is, is we all know that, you know, for every dawn there might be other people that it's not effective for. Um, but we have to figure out ways that we can find the people that are ready to change and help them change. Uh, and, and I think that, you know, understanding what that return on investment is uh, is going to be key to this. So... I will close off there, and I think we've got a few minutes for some questions. Um, we managed to get through uh, the technical difficulties, so thank you for bearing with me. Um, well, yeah, let's, let's jump into some questions and see, see what we've got. Thank you very much, Dr. Byrne, for, for your informative and thoughtful presentation there. Um, ladies and gentlemen on the line, it's now time for our Q&A. Uh, before we begin that session, uh, Fanny, if you could quickly remind our listeners uh, what to do if they'd like to ask a question over the phone. Perfect. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. To queue up your question, please press zero one on your keypad. And uh, to remove your question from the queue, please press the pound sign. So we'll just give everyone a few seconds to queue up. Yeah, while we do that, I, uh, I have a couple that came in during the the presentation. So, Dr. Byrne, um, two here are very similar. Just organize them. Uh, what about a whole foods or plant-based diet for reversing type 2 diabetes? Uh, is low carb the only way? Um, this commenter said, uh, according to the WHO, a plant-based diet is another great option. Yeah, so I didn't really touch on that from the standpoint of what I'm saying, you know, so Plant-based is a great option, and, um, and generally speaking, um, well, plant-based, you can get kind of all the protein that you need, uh, and you can uh, you, you certainly get enough fiber, which helps in this process, um, and you get all the micronutrients that are in our wonderful plants. So, yeah, absolutely can go uh, whole food plant-based. Um, the key, though, is whole food, right? And so it's actually getting rid of the refined carbohydrates, the processed foods, um, the foods that have basically, you know, are full of sugar or full of, you know, white flour or refined carbohydrates that get absorbed rapidly and quickly. So one thing you can't do is you can't go on a plant-based diet that's not whole food, right? So if you go on a plant-based diet where you're relying, uh, you know, um, you know, on uh, refined carbohydrates for energy, you, that's not going to work. But whole foods, absolutely whole food, plant-based, even better. Um, and from an environment and ethical perspective, which is kind of my personal belief, I think it's, it's perfect. 
What I found in practice, though, is I try to meet people where they are, and uh, I try not to uh, necessarily impose my beliefs around the plant-based versus uh, animal, uh, you know, based um, on that side. Um, and so, try to meet people where they are, move them to whole foods first. If we can get them to have more plant-based, uh, what they need, to, they generally benefit from more plants because of fiber. Um, that that works. Uh, and if we can get them all the way to whole food plant-based. Uh, with, uh, with low or there, you're really talking slow carb, right? The carbs with lots of fiber that don't generate the insulin response. Um, it's, it's awesome. Thanks, Dr. Byrne. Uh, Fanny, are there any questions on the line? I have a few here, but I don't want to ignore the, the line. Uh, we don't have any questions at the moment, but just as a quick reminder to queue up for a question, please press zero one. Okay, so let's continue on. I think this one is, is linking to identification here. It's uh, what kind of predictive claiming did Don have that could have helped us identify him earlier? I think this is from, if, if I had to guess, this is probably from a group benefit mm -hmm. lens in terms of I have a population, how do I hone in on them for the purposes of, of this activity? Yeah, I mean, Don's interesting, right? So he, he had been on insulin for 20 years. Right, so if you you know if, if insulin was a trigger for this, um, he would have shown up 20 years ago. Um, mind you, 20 years ago there w weren't many of us that were thinking diabetes reversal, um, and so you know he he he's probably the outlier in in the sense. And, and to be fair, his his story is the most dramatic because of how far he you know was into his type two diabetes and still how much of that process was reversible. Um, you know, I, I think that better triggers are, are likely, um, in, in a way, I think better triggers may be when, when you start to see the first prescription for, a, you know, a GLP-1 agonist or a, you know, SGLT-2 uh, inhibitor, right? So when you start to see the expensive medications being prescribed as the second line after metformin, I think you've got a pretty good, you know, trigger at that point. Now, I don't know how that would work in, in, in your world. Um, you know, the, the other thing, thing really is, is, is looking at it from a more stratified approach, which would be, um, you know, everybody with, with prediabetes or diabetes um, being offered uh, some kind of lifestyle program uh, and then being more aggressive uh, with people that are on medications where the, you know, both the return on investment um, would be better, but also to be you know, really, really frank, the, 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 the life transformation will be even more profound. Thanks, Dr. Byrne. Uh, next question through the queue here, and then we'll go back to see if anyone's on the line. Uh, in, in this study, is there any evidence that the pancreatic cell functions have restored back from 20 to 50 percent uh, higher yeah. once the functions are gone, or are they gone permanently? So this is a great question. And um, so conventional wisdom, and I didn't get into this, but conventional wisdom is that those pancreatic cells are gone, right? They're, uh, but the reason why conventional wisdom is that is because they essentially were, you know, so rat studies, they weren't human studies, they were staining for uh, precursors of insulin. So the cells lost their ability to produce insulin, um, they wouldn't show up on a stain. So the thought was that the beta cells were gone. Uh, what Taylor and his crew showed at the cell study level was what actually happens is the beta cells de-differentiate backwards and they lose, so they, they basically, so, you know, cells differentiate into their kind of final forms. These ones kind of go back to a more primitive state where they've lost their ability to create insulin, but the cell's still alive. Um, and so that's why you see this, this ability for these cells to come back. And so one of the questions, you know, that, that I think is still outstanding is, is you know, what percentage of you know, pancreatic function can come back, um, and you know, are there are there individual variations there? What you're seeing, kind of in practice, though, is um, you know, when we do this four plus two, you know, we um, we, we very commonly get people off of insulin. Um, so if people come in and they're on relatively, you know, if they're under 50 units of insulin per day, generally speaking, they'll come off insulin within the first three three weeks. Um, so we do see kind of restoration of of pancreatic function in pretty much everybody. But at the cellular level, you know, it used to be that conventional wisdom was that the cells were dead. 
now what we know is they're, they're really not dead. They're just de-differentiated backwards. Uh, it does take longer for that to kind of normalize fully. So uh, you, do start, you do see improvements kind of over, over a longer period. Thank you. Uh, Fanny, any on the line? Uh, we don't have any questions at the moment. Okay. No worries. Plenty here. Uh, so, so this one was kind of a two-parter, the first one you answered. But, um, you know, if assuming we have the ability to identify or have a strategy uh, to deploy, um, from a change management perspective, is there, do you have any advice on the best way to reach plan members to educate them and, and get them sort of off the pre-contemplation and get them a party to this? Yeah, so uh, another really good question, um, and, and just kind of with the language, um, so pre-contemplation is kind of one of the readiness for change stages. Um, really, you know, the, the factor, people need to be ready to make these changes. Um, nothing that I've outlined is very hard. And in fact, you know, in, in a lot of ways, lifestyle medicine is actually really quite simple. Um, it's just not that easy for people to do, right? There's just lots of changes and things they, they need to do and be consistent with. So um, putting it on somebody that's really kind of in pre-contemplative phase uh, probably doesn't make sense. So usually for people who are pre-contemplative, what we want to do is, is make them aware, um, you know, actually kind of create a sense that this is, you know, reversal is possible. Um, you know, three years ago, I think if I had said diabetes reversal, um, you know, there would have been, a, a, you know, somebody censored this and say, you can't say reversal, you know. You, yeah. But people are now really realizing, yes, diabetes reversal is possible. Does the disease go away, the underlying tendency towards it? Probably not. But the resistance process is clearly reversible, and we can kind of watch it go back and forth. Um, so, so getting people that are ready to make change uh, and then being able to offer it to, I think, is, is essential. Creating the awareness of this so people can, can go there. Um, we, we, do, uh, we do these uh, six-week education programs that um, we have phenomenal kind of, uh, you know, uptake on. Um, so there are lots of people out there, uh, you know, very few people with type 2 diabetes don't want to reverse it. Um, most just didn't know that it was possible. Um, and, you know, identifying or stratifying based on some kind of um, readiness for change might be the, you know, that, that might be the key, the key thing in terms of scaling this. Okay. Um, thank you. Uh, I've got three questions. I'm going to try and jam into one here. I uh, may not do a great job of it, but um, it, it's kind of diet and exercise focused. So the thematics, you'll, you'll understand. I guess from an intermittent fasting point of view, does the time of fasting and the fasting each day matter? And then um, from a, an exercise point of view, um, is there, you know, the 150 minutes, is, is there one type of movement or intensity of exercise that's better than another? Yeah, so, so the intermittent fasting or time-restricted eating, you know, usually what we start with is trying to get people just to 12 hours, right? And so that I don't even think should have a label. It should just be called normal. We probably should, should give ourselves 12 hours between eating. Um, you know, by around 12 hours, if we're metabolically flexible, most of us will flip over to fat burning. And so it sort of pushes the system towards that kind of metabolic flexibility. Uh, in the beginning, if insulin levels are really high, it's harder to get there. Um, so, so we generally don't push it. What you find, though, in practice is you start with kind of nudging people towards those 12 hours. Um, and usually kind of after a couple of weeks, people come in and go, you know, I'm not hungry anymore. It's crazy, right? Every morning for the last 20 years or 30 years, I've been ravenously hungry in the morning, and now I'm not. And they, they regenerate, it, they, 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 they have, start to be more metabolically flexible and they're burning fat. So uh, extending that to, you know, 14 or 16 hours um, you, works for a lot of people. It uh, doesn't work for everybody. Not everybody feels great that way. And, and kind of one of our principles is, is you actually want people to be, um, you know, feeling well and feeling full of energy, or it's probably not really working for them. Um, the second question around the 150 minutes of exercise, I think, is, is you know, that's kind of the World Health Organization, um, you know, kind of came up with that. That's the threshold where you get most of the benefits of exercise. Um, 
And, and when you're insulin resistant, it really doesn't matter what exercise you're going to do. Um, you're probably going to burn glycogen in, in the process just because your muscles are, um, are not very flexible. Um, as you get fitter, um, you'll start to be more aerobically fit. And then when you're doing aerobic exercise, um, kind of the lower level of aerobic exercise, you, you, you actually burn fat more preferentially. Um, so one of the tricks that we, we have kind of in our toolkit is, is we'll often kind of get people doing that fast and then doing aerobic exercise in the morning in a fasted state when their body's already primed to burn fat. Um, and that's as close to the magic wand as we get because studies show that doing exercise in a fasted state in the morning um, decreases abdominal fat to the high, to, you know, preferentially over, over other fats. So, you know, that's as close as we get to that magic wand to get rid of that pound of butter that's mucking everything up in the liver. Thank you. We'll go with one more here. And I think, you know, this is, this is a bit of a softball, but I think it help, will help clarify for the audience as well. Uh, does this work or benefit type 1 diabetics? Yeah, so, so type 1 diabetes is, you know, completely different because it's an autoimmune disorder that wipes out the pancreatic beta cells and, and really does wipe them out. So they're gone. Um, what does help with type 1 diabetes, if you did the 4 plus 2, um, you'd have to modify it a little bit, right? So the whole, the whole food flow carbohydrate absolutely works. Just dose response in terms of you know, carbohydrate versus insulin. Um, and a lot of type 1 diabetics that are well controlled do this. The exercise helps as well. Um, there are benefits of, you know, when you get to more exercise, you actually can dispose of glucose without insulin even better. So that's for type 1 diabetics key. Um, the alcohol and fructose aren't going to help anymore in, 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 uh, you know, in type 1. Um, and, and, and the other thing with type 1 is, is a lot of type 1 diabetics get insulin resistance because of the insulin they're taking, right? So, you know, if you look at the claims, um, the people, people use more and more insulin over time, right? Because they're, it's not because they're, you know, like, think about it. It's not because they're doing things differently. It's the insulin's just not working as well because they have, they essentially have type 2 layered over type 1. So that will help. Uh, what you can't do is you can't do the, you know, fasting, right? So if, you know, it becomes very challenging if somebody's taking insulin uh, to do prolonged fasting. So you have to be more careful about food timing uh, and, uh, and generally speaking, kind of uh, type 1s working kind of with, uh, with a practitioner, um, really kind of what you want to do. You, you don't want to have a type 1 uh, start a 16-hour fast because uh, the, the, the insulin will lower the sugar regardless of everything else going on. So, so yeah, it, it, you know, this type of strategy can work with type 1s. We've, we've, uh, I, I don't have a ton of experience working with type 1s in this context, um, but a little bit. Um, and there are, some, there are actually some really you know, interesting examples uh, out there on the Internet of type 1 diabetics who uh, share their, you know, their journey in what they've been able to do um, and reduce the amount of insulin they take. Uh, Dr. Byrne, I think we'll, we'll call it there, but thank you for your time today. Um, for those on the line, we hope you found uh, this information valuable. And as always, it was certainly an honor for us to deliver this to you today. Uh, as I mentioned at the onset, this webinar will be available in about one week's time. And if you wish to be notified, just please go to the Health Benefits Hub uh, and subscribe to add your name to the wait waiting list. Uh, as I mentioned, we're always looking for ways to improve. Tell us what we did well. Tell us what we could improve on areas you'd like to see us uh, for future series. Um, you'll be invited to do a three-minute survey in just a few moments here when you log off. So please do that. And um, also, we'll be uh, processing this attendance list for continuing education credits, just a reminder. Uh, so please expect to hear back from us in a couple weeks' time. And lastly, thank you uh, to our uh, speaker today as well as to our sponsors and insurers, steering committee partners for helping make this possible. Um, next week is our final webinar in our virtual conference. Uh, if you haven't already done so, please make sure to register. It's National Pharmacare in the Age of COVID-19, and it's on June 9th, and it'll be presented by Dr. Bob Bell. He's the former Deputy Minister of Health and Michelle McLean, the Senior Vice President Health and Wellness at Knowlton, uh, Hill and Knowlton, sorry. Uh, 
Aside from that, uh, we'd like to thank you for your participation today. Thank you for the thoughtful questions. We hope you enjoyed today's presentation. Have a wonderful afternoon. Look forward to seeing you next week and stay well.